Yes, I'm Maureen Yoder from Lesse University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And this is 18 for 18. I am going to go very quickly and go over 18 very exciting tools and trends that teachers can use in their classrooms. Most of them you can use tomorrow. So stay tuned. Emojis is one guess. Kids like them. Kids like them. Another. Love them. Yeah. What else? They all have red. They all have red? I think so. Yes, yeah, that is very good. Um, actually, um, these are the door prizes. And um, I'll tell you why you might want to take home a little chickadee because they are thumb drives. They are little thumb drives. Look. Oh, how cute. Stocking stuffers or keep it for yourself, you know? So, um, they really fun. Okay, so make sure you get your name in there because odds are pretty good. Um, so this is called 18 for 18, Tools and Trends. And it's going to go really, really fast. If you've, if you've ever been to one of my, has anyone ever been to one of my sessions before? Yes, I go really, really fast. But I will give you all of the links so you can relax and just enjoy it. Enjoy it, okay? Um, it's sort of like going through a buffet where you see, you take oh. a little bit of everything and then you go back and take a bigger portion of what you really enjoy. It's also like one of those bus trips where you go through the city and you decide what you would um, like to go back to and spend a whole day on. So some of these slides, I'm going to go so fast you won't even have a chance to read them. But um, you might think, oh, I'd like to learn more about that, so you go back. I'm not going to stop for questions. It's not going to be one of those real nice interactives, speak among yourselves for a while. It's not going to be like that. Um, OK, so the other thing is, when you um, email me, there's the, my email. Just email me. Um, if there's something that I didn't include that you can't believe I didn't include, just um, email me and I will include it somehow when I send out the, the slides, okay? Um, all right, so here we go. All right, how did I choose the 18? Well, I could have included 100, but you know, 18 is still a lot for an hour. And uh, one of the things I do is I'm always looking like this to see what, um, what trends are happening. This article, this is um, from last month, and they talked about three trends, the augmented reality trend, the voice-enabled speakers in the home, and semi-autonomous driving technologies. I'm not going to talk about self-driving cars as one of the 18, but I am going to talk about the other two, especially the voice-enabled speakers in the home, because that's something that I didn't know a real lot about. I mean, I know about Alexa, and I've used it and all that, but I didn't understand the potential in classrooms. So I'm going to include that and a couple of examples, because there aren't many sessions on that. And I think it's really an exciting possibility. OK, here's another one. Um, Six digital <coughs> transformational trends in education. Um, augmented virtual and mixed realities, number one. I'm going to talk about that quite a bit. Also, artificial intelligence, which comes into that smart speaker. Uh, there are a few chairs here. There's one, two, three chairs if you want to come sit. Um, and uh, some of the others classroom set of devices. I won't talk about specifically, but some of the 18, you will need a classroom set, or a, at least a few of these devices to use. Okay, and here's another. Uh, this is more pirate, but faculty predicted that uh, virtual augmented mixed reality will be key. They um, mentioned a whole bunch of trends, and virtual augmented reality was number one. And I do think it's, it's quite, um, Quite exciting. Now, I'm going to be doing a whole session just on augmented reality on Thursday. So I'm going to still include it today because it is important.
but um, there's really enough for a whole day. So I'm going to do a whole session Thursday on that. So anything I do today is just a little bit of what I'll do Thursday in that topic. Okay, so number one, virtual reality. Um, you've probably heard of this before. I went to a wonderful session earlier today, and um, it's really when you're looking through a viewer and you see your entire vision is covered, you're totally immersed. And most adults, when they first look at it, they look like this. But you can actually go all the way around and up and down and see everything. Now, there, I'm going to talk about the viewers, and I have a couple that I can show you. Um, so Google Cardboard is just one of them. It's a low-cost version. You can buy them directly through Google, or you can get them in, in many other ways. And I'll mention this later, but look at the difference in the size. There was a version 1 and a version 2. Version 1 wasn't called version 1. It's just sort of like World War II wasn't, World War I wasn't called World War I until there was a World War II. So um, uh, be careful. Don't get version 1 if you have a bigger phone. It won't fit. OK, so make sure you get version 2. Some of them actually say V2. But check on the size before you get it. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like. It's, uh, uh, but your brain uh, moves them together, and you see a really nice view. Um, you put your phone in it. How many have used these? OK, I assume, I'm making an assumption that most people know a little bit about this. OK, here's another one. Google's coming out with a more expensive one, Google Daydream View. And then there are loads of them. This is just a screenshot I took this morning of um, some of the ones that are available. Um, I really like the heavy duty plastic ones. They aren't that expensive anymore. You can get them for $15 or less. And um, it's a lot better. Kids have colds and these get um, germy and they kind of fall apart after a while. And these aren't much more expensive. So I get that. Um, so I talk about when you're choosing them, I talked about version one and two already cardboard or plastic, the quality of it. Um, some of them now, we have to be careful. We have to make sure that they will work with the operating system that you use. And um, some of them come totally flat and you put them together yourself. And some of them come already assembled. And of course, there's the cost. How is it used? Well. It's used in a lot of different ways. I threw this in because I think it's pretty fascinating <coughs> that it's being used now in surgical training um, for, for doctors. And here's just one scene. There are lots of examples of this because they can look at um, a part of the human body in all different uh, views. And then they're used for virtual tours. And if you're interested in a certain college, you, many of them now have these virtual tours. So before you even go there, you can see what the kids are really interested in, like what my dorm is going to look like, things like that. And they're using them for promoting and recruiting. Then there are a whole bunch of categories that I would call travel. Uh, sometimes you're going to ruin, sometimes historical sites around the, the world. Um, there are loads of them for museums and they really vary. Many of them are free, so it's easy to try them out. Before you use them with your kids, see what's going on. Sometimes they use sound, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're just still images, other times they're videos. So they're all different variables, and you need to see, before you use it with your students, what's going to work for you. They're also used for therapy. Uh, there, there are a few examples. People who are afraid to fly, they use virtual reality and they actually go on a trip, but they're just sitting very comfortably in a chair on the ground before they have get up the courage to, to go actually take a flight. Um, and they're used for, when we talk about sensitivity, there are a couple of examples where they can simulate what it's like if you have autism and and a lot of uh, sounds and movements can uh, disturb you. So you can actually look through 
and see what it's like and feel what it's like to have all of this stimulus, uh, all these stimuli come, come toward you. So it's used for that. And any kind of uh, fear, any kind of phobia, fear of hospitals, there's an app for that now where you can actually go through some of the experiences uh, virtually. And then, of course, there's, there's classrooms. And the natural use of this is virtual field trips. So there are all sorts of virtual field trips. You can go to the moon, you can go underneath the water, you can go to any place in the entire world now. And obviously, some of these places are too dangerous or too expensive to go to as a regular field trip. So where do you find them? Well, Google is, is really on the cutting edge here. And I'm gonna mention it twice, first now and a little bit later, because Expeditions is really evolving. It originally, it really was just virtual reality. And they had a whole bunch of wonderful apps, classroom materials, lesson plans, everything. Um, so it was quite easy to use, and all you needed were a bunch of viewers. Okay, But then um, they've, they've evolved, and I'll tell you about that in a little bit. Um, also, you could just search. You can search. I just put in the YouTube search space 360 educational videos, and I just found hundreds of them. So that's another way you can, you can find them. Um, but you can also get a particular app, like the NYTVR, that's New York Times Virtual Reality. Uh, a couple of years ago, they actually started this. They had a whole bunch of expert journalists and videographers who recorded wonderful documentaries. And they partnered with the New York Times, um, the print edition people. And one Sunday, they sent three million of these Google headsets, these viewers, the flat, uh, unassembled ones, in the Sunday print edition of the New York Times. So all these people, uh, mostly around the New York area, got these, didn't quite know what to do with them, and then they went to the app, and they were able to take these virtual trips. So they, this was a while ago, and, and it's one of the um, wonderful efforts they made to, uh, to get this into classrooms, because teachers started to, to use these, because they were so beautifully done, and um, they continue. Um, this is called, I mentioned the Daily 360, because they used to have just a handful, and now they have uh, so many, and they're coming out with them every day. Um, the New York, the uh, uh, Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, as we were talking about before, um, during the parade, did you see any of these ads that, that uh, Verizon had, that you could watch it in 360? And you didn't actually need a viewer. You could just have it on your screen, and scrolling, you could look all around, up and down the street, and it was really realistic. You could also do it with viewers, but um, they made an effort and they did a great job. So you can see the whole parade. What's televised is only a fraction of the parade. That's only a little bit. There are all sorts of bands that never get on TV. So this was a way to see the whole thing. Um, National Geographic is another company, along with NASA, who has really made a wonderful contribution in the education market for this. And it's, um, uh, it's in all different categories. As you see, you know, dinosaur ocean, safari, farm, and sort of. Unlike the New York Times, all of them are not in this particular app. They have a whole bunch of apps, whereas the New York Times, everything is within that one app. Um, and now, some of these you can choose VR, virtual reality, or augmented reality. So that's kind of my segue to the next one, number two, augmented reality. And I'm going to spend a, f a few of these, a uh, few of the numbers on this. This is just the introduction. And augmented reality goes beyond virtual because it actually mixes the reality. You're looking through your device and you see something pop up in your real world, like Pokemon. Everybody knows Pokemon. That's whenever somebody says, "What is augmented reality?" That's what I refer to because most people know that. Okay, so 
Um, the key terms here are trigger and overlay. A trigger is what you look, like, look at when you are pointing your device, and the overlay is what happens. It could be a video, it could be a still, it could have sound, um, those sorts of things, okay? Tim Cook, uh, in one of his recent speeches a few weeks ago, talked about how uh, he says it's going to change the way we use technology forever. This is really going to explode, and much of it, luckily, is affordable, and you can use it tomorrow in your classroom. That's what's so great about it. Um, so uh, Thursday, I'll go into more detail, but there's a lot of information that justifies using this with kids, and it ties it to standards, common core, and all that. So if you need to justify this, um, I always like to give people a bunch of resources so that they can um, talk to people who are maybe doubting whether it's worthwhile, okay? Um, so I'm gonna, we're gonna look first at a couple two-dimensional two triggers, okay? So a very hungry caterpillar. What they're doing now is they're taking some books that have been around a long, long time and they are turning them into augmented reality triggers. So you can view pages of Very Hungry Caterpillar and see the caterpillar move and do all sorts of cool things. Okay, so the book actually comes alive, right? I'm not gonna play the video, but this is the link where you can see it. Okay, then there are books, and I have a bunch of them. This is one of them. Uh, not every single picture is augmented reality, but many of them are, and you can, the book actually comes to life, and it's pretty neat because you'll, you'll see uh, the solar system, you'll see these planets, and in the back is your kitchen. I mean, it, they come alive within your reality, which is kind of neat. Okay, and then there are uh, two-dimensional printouts where you get uh, pages that look like coloring books. You color them in, or the kids color them in, and then it comes to life again. So you, you get the animation, and uh, some of them are just kind of fun. Many of them are really instructional. Okay, so this is a very common one. If, if um, I'm mentioning it because it, it's always in the top 10. When you look at top 10 uses of augmented reality, this is almost always there. And it's called anatomy and anatomy 4D, and what you do is you have a printout, and when you point your device at it, it turns into that, and you can de see different systems in the body. There's also one for the heart. When you look at the heart, the heart starts pumping, you hear it pump, and you can see the different parts of the heart. So these are really, um, simplified versions of the ones they're using in medical school because the ones they're using in medical school are really helping uh, future doctors and nurses uh, become familiar with the parts of the body. Okay, so they're also three-dimensional triggers. This again, this, I'm mentioning this because it's always in the top 10, uh, elements. And elements involves six blocks and what you do is you print them out, that's what the printout looks like, you cut it out. Um, you can just tape them to each other, but I like taping them to, these are just wooden blocks, two inch wooden blocks that I bought on Amazon. And um, uh, what you do is you put them together, and when you make certain, you know what this is? H, H2O. yeah, H2O. H2O. Okay, so when you put H2O underneath your phone or your device, it turns into water, and you actually see the water. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about it in Thursday, but it's really, it goes beyond just pointing at something and having it animate. This really involves experimentation and a lot of fun look, looking at these. It doesn't have all the elements, because they're just six blocks, so it has 36, but it's, it's a lot of fun. Okay, 
Um, and if you want to go a little farther afield, you can look up at the sky with one of these and you actually see the, um, the constellations. Okay, and you can learn about that. The other thing that's remarkable is it doesn't always, with, there are many of these apps. With many of them, it doesn't have to be dark. We always think it has to be dark. It doesn't have to be dark. And you can actually point it down and it'll show the constellations in the other side of the world. Okay, so it goes beyond what you could do with your naked eye. This is one that's kind of fascinating. Um, it's called uh, Measure Kit, and you actually can measure things pointing, and like I could find out how big this room is without walking it out or taking a big um, measuring wow. tool to do it. So there's a lot of possibilities in the classroom if you uh, think about what you can do with these. All right, language translation. You've probably heard of Google Translate. Uh, it's getting more and more sophisticated. Google Translate, uh, you know about it on the computer where you can type in some, something and it'll come out in another language. Well, this, you actually point your device at a sign. Not only does it translate it, but it translates it in the same color and font as the sign, which I think is very interesting. Okay, and there are a lot of teachers are using this in a variety of ways. Um, some of them, if they write a note to a parent who doesn't speak the same language, uh, they may have to apologize, say there are a few little errors, but at least you could write home um, something in, in Spanish, okay? Um, also, some teachers are using it where they have a translate, and then the real challenge is to see what's wrong with the translation. That's the real challenge. Not to use it instead of doing your homework, but you know, translate this and tell me what's wrong. And then in class, they talk about what's wrong. Maybe the, the, um, the grammar isn't correct or something like that. Okay, and others use it to make their own phrase books with illustrations and stuff, okay? Travel and history, there are loads of apps for this. Um, I just want to tell you about this because time looper is interesting. You actually point your device at a place and it will take you back in time. You can go to the Tower of London or you click on a picture of the Tower of London and it will show what's, what went on many, many years ago. So it isn't just history about the Tower of London now, it's, it shows you some of the history. And, um, um, time travel, they talk about the VR mode and the AR mode. So some of these apps are going, um, uh, you can use them in more than one way. Here's one example. Um, in Washington, D.C., you can either go to these places or look at a picture of them, and um, these are some of the different topics. You can go to the Vietnam Memorial, the Jefferson Memorial, the Lincoln Memorial, um, uh, the world. You can go to these different memorials and it'll give you some history about why, um, why there's a memorial. Um, and then there's Spacecraft 3D. This is another popular one. And uh, this gives you the sense of being uh, traveling through space. Okay. Um, now, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I want you to know that one of the real powers of uh, the powerful part of augmented reality is that it's really easy to create your own. You can create your own aura. <coughs> Remember the two things you need? You need a trigger and an overlay. My f and one of the uses, for instance, is like art exhibits. Now, a lot of people have used QR codes, so you go to an art exhibit in, a, in the classroom or in the hallway for back to school night, and you can um, read something using a, a barcode, but you can also actually just, with augmented reality, you just point it at that picture and up comes a video by the student who painted it, okay? Or if it's um, in a museum, it could be a, a curator who talks about the painting. So you get this, this painting kind of comes alive and you learn more about it that way. Um, some schools are doing this with their yearbooks, so you point your device at the football team, the picture of the football team, and they start to play, 
okay? And somebody gets a touchdown, so you see a little video. And the kids are putting these together because it's really easy. Um, I put one together. All I did was take a picture of, of a place on campus. That was my trigger image. It was just a small JPEG file. And then um, the overlay was a video um, done with my cell phone. And um, then what I did was put them together, trigger plus overlay equals aura. I used Erasma, there yes. were a few others, but I like Erasma, it doesn't have ads, it's easy to use, but one hint, when you do it with a whole class, use one account. <laughs> I learned the hard way. To have a whole bunch of different accounts is, it gets a little crazy, so I would use one account. Um, but I also want to tell you something I learned the hard way. There's the Erasma app. The Erasma app is on your phone or your, your device, and it's really good for scanning, first following somebody, then scanning the trigger. It's not so good for creating the auras. It's just not as good, because when you have it on your computer, you can go into a file of videos or a file, a folder of, of uh, uh, images. So, it's much better to create the auras on your computer with Erasmus Studio, but use your app to read them, okay? That's from um, a few headaches I had, and I wanted you to learn from that. Okay, Google Expeditions. Now, we had talked about that before, but now Google Expeditions has a new version that includes augmented reality, and what it does, the kids have these selfie stick, a good use for a selfie stick, and their, um, their phones in the selfie stick, and they can actually see a volcano erupt right in their classroom, and they can walk around it and look at it in different views. Okay, so that's what Expeditions is working on now. So you see, um, uh, the website is edu.google.com expeditions slash AR and you'll learn a lot more about what they're doing lately. Okay, 3D. I'm just gonna tell you about this one project that I think is fascinating. This was in The Verge. Google, and this, this is brand new, Google is launching an object library. It's already launched it. And you can go in there and do a search and you will see all of these 3D objects that you can use in your projects. So it's called Polly, and I typed in dog, and when I, um, after I typed it in, I got 192 items, and these are some of the dogs that I found, okay? Now, you also got hot dogs, and you got dog food, and you got bones, but you got all these different kind of dogs and you can use them in your three-dimensional projects, okay? Mm -hmm. So I think that's pretty cool. I do have a short video on this, let's see. Reality, the world needs more and more 3D objects. But right now, these objects are hard to find. That's why we built Poly, a new platform that lets you discover, view, and download 3D objects and scenes. Search through thousands of free objects and once you've found what you're looking for, you can view it in full 3D or download to use in your AR or VR applications. Start browsing today at poly.google.com. Okay, so we just finished number nine and we're halfway through. Good. Okay, next. Uh, the next three are about robots, but I divided them into three categories. <coughs> Using robots, programming them, and building them. Because I see those as three very different exercises, and the robots are different too. So um, I was looking through a whole bunch, and I looked at all these names. Uh, there's Ido, there's Jibo, Kibo, Curry, Laika, Maya, Ali, and Philbin. And that's only a few. So I looked at all of them. And some of them I'm going to talk about, and some of them I'm not. But um, it's, it's just, I thought it was kind of funny how many of them 
Uh, they must have thought that if you have four letters in the name, that would help you sell it or something. I don't know. Um, and Jibo and Kibo are totally different companies, so don't get them mixed up because they really are different, and, and you'll see why. They aren't related, even though they rhyme. Okay, so using them. Uh, one of the ways that these are used, and these are pretty expensive robots, but they're very powerful and they're life-changing. Uh, Vigo is one of them, you may have seen them, they're about this tall, and often these kind of robots are used in classrooms as a, they call them remote student, when a student cannot go to school, when they're homebound or hospital bound or something like that. This is this changes their life because they can participate in school. And um, there's a wonderful story, and this actually, this story is about a boy named Philip from Walpole, Massachusetts, although this made national news. Um, he's not that far away. And I'll show you a little video so you see it. But you see his robot, it's that black thing with his picture at the top, skinny little thing. I am a fourth grade teacher, and Philip is my student. This is his second time battling leukemia. Great job. He decided to go with a bone marrow transplant, which does require him to be out of school for an entire year. Excellent. This technology will make it so that we're able to connect to him at all times, which is amazing, and we love every minute of it with him. The robot is called the Philbot. We do have a classroom full of nine and ten year olds, which is very exciting. And to see the robot was overwhelming at first. Philip, are you showing me I agree with you? Did you like that article? <laughs> there you go. He heads to his desk, he does his lesson. Hi. He does not feel excluded from anything. They like to have snack with them, they like to joke with them. The social part of it is so important, it can't be replicated other than being here virtually with this robot. Bye. See you later, bud. Most of the videos I'm showing you are really edited down to less than a minute, okay? So I have the link if you want to see the entire video because it's, it's much longer. Okay, programming them. This is one that's gotten a lot of press lately. Um, it's called the Edison Robot and it's $40. And that's one of the reasons it's gotten a lot of press because it's pretty um, affordable. But there are quite a few of them and um, this is what the coding looks like. It's very similar, if you've used Scratch or um, Scratch for the younger kids, um, you'd be familiar with it. And it's very easy, very um, uh, simple to learn. Um, and this is a little video. Edison can see and hear by using infrared light and sound sensors. He can find his way around obstacles, sense light levels, detect lines, and respond to sound commands. With pre-installed programs, Edison is fun right out of the box. Just add battery, print some barcode, and start exploring. You can also control Edison with standard TV and DVD remotes. Controlling Edison is really easy. You can learn programming skills in an entertaining and engaging way. The Edware program uses drag and drop graphical icons to make programming simple to learn. Edison is Lego compatible, allowing him to grow into a much bigger robot or a completely new invention. For robotics enthusiasts, Edison can be used as a basic building block for advanced projects. Edison has been built tough. How tough? Well, tough enough to be driven over by a car and still work. <laughs> driven over by a car. I think it'll last in your classroom then. All right, um, so building them. Um, this is another level when you're actually building the robot. Now it doesn't mean that you're gonna program it. Some, some of them you build and that's it. It's a one-time experience, but if you can build it, then program it. Um, so this is actually a site, uh, 11 of the best build your own robot kits kids for kids, and I just chose to put two of them on the screen, the one that's the most popular and the one that's the lowest price. The lowest price one, you actually take a tin can and you turn it into a robot, okay? And um, 
you know, for, for $10. Once you've done it, I don't know how much excitement you can generate after that, but you can turn a tin can into a robot. Um, and Dash has been around for a long time. It's very popular and um, it's something that uh, teachers have been very pleased with. Uh, this one, though, was considered the best robot building kit of the year by this particular website. And it's the Little Bits. You've probably heard of Little Bits, too. And they're also a really important player in, in this area. Uh, this one is different, though. Um, Kibo is a kit, but the difference here is that you, you, don't really pro you don't program it with a computer. You put the pieces together without any, you, without any screen time, okay? We are here to tell you about Kibo. Kibo is a robot kit designed for young children ages four to seven. Children can program Kibo using wooden blocks as instructions so it can interact with the world, move around, respond to sound, light or distance, and turn the light on. And like other robot kids, Kibo is so easy to play with that even non-technical adults can use it without reading the instructions. Adults. Young children learn by playing. With Kibo, children can become programmers, engineers, artists, choreographers, and storytellers because Kibo play is open-ended. Kids build and decorate their robots. Along the way, they explore concepts such as sequencing, cause and effect, patterns and problem solving. And research shows that learning sequencing is foundational for academic success, math and literacy skills, and developing executive functions. Kibo doesn't require a PC, tablet, or cell phone. With Kibo, young children don't sit in front of a screen, so it's perfectly appropriate for active kids. Okay, and there's a lot more to that video, but I wanted to give you an idea. So, if you don't have a class set of devices or anything, this might be the robot for you. Okay. Um, also, I wanted to mention that there are a whole bunch of face-to-face um, -face workshops, maker spaces, all sorts of things. This one happens to be coming up uh, very soon, this weekend, um, and it's in Massachusetts, but just gives you an idea. There's a Family Day Scratch Junior workshop and a Family Day uh, Kibo. So there's a lot going on. If you and this is um, sponsored by uh, DevTech, and they're a research group. Uh, Tufts University, MIT is involved, and uh, the company that makes the um, the Kibo is too. Okay, but um, these are usually either free or very affordable, and um, it's something to look at because it gives you hands-on experience. I've done some of these and that's how I can get experience with actually, without actually going out and buying these robots. Okay, drones. Um, are there educational benefits? Well, some people think so, some people not. I have four mini drones that um, I've used and they're, they're quite fun. You can use it with a remote control or you can program them. So um, there is a bit of a learning curve. I suggest doing it in a great big wide open space like a gym. I, I won't take my drones outside I'm afraid they're going to fly away and I'll never get them back. Um, but um, a big gym or something like that, not a small room. Um, so it's fun to play with these, um, but there is some advanced programming. Also, um, there are a bunch of sites. This is just one of them, uh, how teachers can use drones for teaching and learning. And if you go to this site, it gives you examples of classroom activities in these areas. Debate is interesting because they're debating whether um, drones are safe, whether uh, something about the privacy <coughs> issue, because um, they can snoop. And uh, there's some real issues. So sometimes it's good to just bring those issues right into the classroom and talk to the kids about it. Um, here's another one, ways to use drones in the classroom, and they have five different ways, and again, they go through different activities that are tied to curriculum using drones. Some people see them as important because of the future employment possibilities, and this is a school where 
they are really taking it seriously and they have a year-long course for high school students and they truly believe that these kids will be prepared to work in the workplace programming drones. There's a lot to know about them. Okay. Um, what to buy? Um, there are a bunch of sites if you're looking for drones. Many of them are really expensive, $1,000. I won't pay more than $100. Um, and some of the ones I've got here are $79. But they're very limited and they're small and the battery life is really short. So um, I would try an inexpensive one first and then um, proceed farther. Okay, this is the, they call this the best drone for beginners and it's only uh, 4380 on Amazon. So there's something like that. And this, I just came across this as I was researching and I, I hadn't heard of it before, but they are using drones to fly around when kids are taking tests. <laughs> okay, and um, it is distracting, but um, I mean, look at all the kids are all looking at the drones instead of doing the test. Uh, and it's, they're using it even more seriously in China. Look at those kids taking tests. Um, and, and they are using them not just to see if the kids are cheating, but to see if they're using any devices to get the answers for the test, okay? Um, uh, now, I'm getting to smart speakers, and I'm gonna start with Amazon Echo. And Amazon Echo is, uh, uh, there's an Amazon Echo, there's an Echo Plus, there's an Echo Dot, there are a whole bunch, and there's an Echo Show that just came out. Um, these, how many of you have one? Thank you, good. Okay. And you probably use it in your home. I do have one in my classroom. You what? I have one in my classroom. Too. You have one in your classroom. I do. I'm trying to get better at using it. I use it for timers, reminders for me as to like who's leaving at the end of the day, to play music. Um, but I haven't gotten the whole like I know use it like to play Jeopardy and things like that. I haven't but but that's a fabulous time. start. Anybody else use one in a classroom? No? Okay. Well, they are possible. Okay, so you can get um, uh, you can get the smaller ones, you can get the Echo Dot, which is um, uh, $49. It actually was a lot less on Black Friday, and uh, you can get deals. What? $29.99. What? $29.99, yeah, I heard that. Okay, um, this is a, a woman who really loves to use Alexa in the classroom, and she has a video that she talks about the, the 30 different ways she uses it, and I just picked out one of them. Um, she helps, she uses the Echo Dot to uh, group her students, um, and she uses it for random numbers and things like that. So she has 30 um, uh, different ways, and if you go to the website and look under the video, um, you can get a printout of the 30 ways. Okay, but I was looking at some of the little apps. They don't really call them apps, they call them uh, skills, um, but if you have the uh, uh, if you have it, then it says free to enable. And um, by enabling the skill, you can access it to all of your, your devices. So there are a whole bunch of them. And I just want to show you that some of them possibly could be used in a classroom. Um, this one is a, a story time. This is another, it's bedtime story, but it's still, you know, stories. Um, here's one that's uh, a trivia kids trivia. This one is called Silly Things and uh, it might be fun for the younger kids, maybe the older kids, I don't know, act like a fish out of water. Um, uh, this is a little more serious for classroom use. Uh, it's a comprehension practice. Um, and then there's a whole bunch more, um, just to give you a sense of some of the names of them and um, board kids. Um, so if you're interested, take a look. As soon as you click on one, you see eight more that you might be interested in. It's like shopping at Amazon. You know? um, and Amazon is actually putting in 1,600 of these at Arizona State University. Okay, And they're experimenting to see how the, the students are going to use them in their classroom. Okay, So another one is um, Google Home. And Google Home also 
has, um, they have the advantage of having Google search engine at their disposal, but I've looked at many of the reviews and some people say that the Amazon one is actually better in some ways when, when they're comparing them, even though Google has the advantage of um, all their search techniques. Okay, um, this is actually a podcast about um, using Google Assistant in the classroom. Um, Google Home is 129, the Mini is 49, and again, these are just list prices. Um, and these are some of the skills or the apps you can use with the Google one. Um, and what you do, if they don't call it Alexa, it's um, you say, hey Google, talk to everyday heroes, and then um, uh, that's how you get started with these apps. So these are some of the ones that I found that, that might, uh, it might be possible for the classroom, I don't know. Um, I'm always happy to see National Geographic because I have found that their apps in whatever form are really quite, quite well done. Um, and then this is who they pair with, so you get YouTube with your phones, you know, Netflix and all of that, okay. Um, and then there's Google Lens, and this is based on the Google Goggles and it's going to be launching with all the Pixel phones. So it's not on all phones, but it's another app and um, uh, talks about it coming weeks. And this is, in some ways, it's like Google Translate because you're able to um, look at a piece of art, for instance, and um, see information about it. Okay, so it's augmented reality again using your, your phone. Okay, and um, I don't want to leave here without talking about some of the controversy about the use of recorded information on these devices, because there have been court cases and it's been pretty serious at times, but they're not going to um, prosecute anybody at this point. And also I wanted to mention that Apple was supposed to come out with HomePod, its answer to Google and Amazon, it didn't. It was supposed to be ready for Christmas, and a few days ago they announced that it isn't. And a lot of people are saying they've really lost their opportunity because Amazon has, Amazon and Google have um, something like 80% of the market in this area. Social robots. Um, this issue of Time Magazine, just um, last week, had a whole bunch of really interesting inventions. And one of them was this robot. Um, and this is Jibo. It rhymes with the other one, but it has nothing to do with it. Okay, now, what's interesting about Jibo is they claim it's a social family kind of robot that has a personality. So I'll show you a little bit. Say hi, Jibo. Hi, Jibo. <laughs> Jibo helps everyone out throughout their day. He's the world's best cameraman. By intelligently tracking the action around him, he can independently take video and photos so that you can put down your camera and be a part of the scene. Jibo, take the picture. Excuse me, Anne? Yes, Jibo. Melissa, just sent a reminder that she's picking you up in half an hour to go grocery shopping. Thanks, Jibo. He's an entertainer and educator. Through interactive applications, Jibo can teach. Let me in, or else I'll... Huh. And I'll... Huh. And I'll blow your house in. Hey, where'd you go? There you are. <laughs> He's a platform, so his skills keep expanding. He'll be able to connect to your home. Welcome home, Eric. Hey, buddy. Can you order some takeout for me? Sure thing. Chinese, as usual? You know me so well. Jibo. This little bot of mine. Okay, here's another one. Ali. Ali also supposedly has a personality. Um, this one is a uh, Indiegogo, so they're, they're still um, raising funds. But you'll see. For so long, technology has been held back by one important thing, emotion. 
That's why we created Ollie, the first robot assistant with an evolving personality. Ollie is proactive, meaning it anticipates your needs. Just a thought, Mika. Shall I set the mood with some jazz while you read? Yeah. Music through Ollie sounds amazing too, because it knows where you are in the room. It can best direct the audio to your liking. Go. 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 One more, Kevin, and you hit your target for the day. Well done. Yotai was started with mission to change human relationships with technology. Or is the first robot system with evolving personality. We bring the best talents from AI, neuron science, engineering, robotics, design and animation that all breathes life into our robots. Oli is the first robotics product that has won four innovation awards in three years. We did that in 2017. Okay, so watch out for that one. Uh, this one I actually reported on last year, and I don't like to repeat things, but I, I looked to see if they were still alive. Some of these little companies never get past the beta stage, and they are. Um, uh, they've gotten all the funding they needed, and they're supposed to be out um, mid-2018, possibly earlier. And it's one that's used with kids, and what's really fascinating about this is you see the kids <coughs> respond to it. Um, and uh, it rolls around on the floor and it lights up and it, it interacts and they've used it very successfully with a lot of special needs kids, so who knows? Uh, wearables. Um, most wearables are either used for kids, are either used to track the kid, their GPS devices or Bluetooth or something, um, or they're used for fitness to make sure um, they track the kids' heart rate and stuff. So that, those are the categories. Um, I looked at this site, 10 Kids Wearables in 2017, and I found a whole bunch of them, and they all look different. Some of them people wear, and some of them people, um, uh, some of them the kids wear on their wrists, and some of them they tag to their backpack, and, and so forth, okay? Um, so, they fall, as I said, they fall into mostly two categories. One of them is trackers, where you're tracking your child, see where your child is all the time. This is, they give it to parents, but sometimes they're used in schools, especially with some special needs kids. Um, uh, the future, now they're saying, you know, it's more than just tracking devices, and they go through some of the devices that um, do more than that. And they have a whole bunch of activities the kids do, and um, uh, every once in a while it'll beep and it'll say you should get up and do jumping jacks or, or hop like a um, kangaroo and it'll show a kangaroo and stuff like that. So it's mostly fitness and mostly tracking. Okay, so we're getting to the end and um, I, because I'm a professor and all that, I feel I should do a little philosophy, educational philosophy. So here's a really, really quick philosophical underpinning this kind of talk. Okay, so Aristotle said, uh, for the things we have to learn, we learn by doing them. So way back then we were talking about doing things. Uh, same thing with John Dewey, gives the people something to do, not just something to learn. Uh, Seymour Papert, uh, the role it teaches to create the conditions for invention. And here I just have a couple of things. I have a pot, I have a typewriter, and I have a laptop because a pot is just a pot, but if you add to a child, you can have a very nice meal. And if you add probe up to a typewriter, you can get the good earth. And if you add you to a laptop, uh, your kids can be exploding with ideas because nothing replaces with teaching. I'm not quite done. Um, when I, I was all done with this presentation, then I wrote a little poem that kind of came to me about Alexa and imagining what would happen if your name, is there anybody named Alexa in here? <laughs> Imagine if your name is Siri or Alexa these days, how often people comment. So this is my little poem. Oh, what would it be like if some years ago your parents gave you a nice name? And what would it be like if that name was Alexa and Amazon called their baby the same? You are asked to request and put to the test, revealing a challenge or task. Did the losing team, team win? Did you close the garage? What next are they going to ask? Some questions delight you, some really can stump you, and some are just really wild. Where is that place? I just can't remember. 
And is Aunt Lucy really with child? But our students live in this new world. The device in their hands is their way. They type with their thumbs way faster than us. But why type when they just have to say a command or a query so totally natural to them as they go through their day? No boundaries between the gadget and them, whether to learn or to play. So we as their teachers must know how to let them go forth and create and explore. Our role is to guide them to learn right beside them and be there to open the door. And that's the end. Thank you.